Um, my name is Sean Evans, and I am one of the co-founders of Art and Feminism. I use she, her pronouns. My name is Jacqueline Maybe. I'm one of the co-founders of Art and Feminism. I use uh, she or they. I'm Mackenzie Mack, the director of Art Plus Feminism. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, hi, I'm Michael Manenberg. I'm one of the co-founders. I use uh, they, them pronouns. Um, and the four of us organize also the uh, global campaign, along with Melissa Tumani, who I believe is watching us on the live stream from Peru. Hi, hi Melissa. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Um, so six years ago, we started a project called Art and Feminism, thinking that basically a few of our friends would show up to the first event, um, and they did, and so did folks around the world. So since 2014, over 10,000 people at more than 800 events around the world have participated in our edit-a-thons, resulting in the creation or, and improvement of more than 33,000 articles on Wikipedia. Um, and we're going to start the panel very soon, but I just have to, uh, we have to make some thank yous first. Uh, first and foremost, we want to thank MoMA's Department of Education uh, and the Library and Archives. Um, we are so indebted to their incredible, dedicated staff, um, and we're really excited to be partner partnering with the New York Public Library this year as well. There will be programming happening at their 53rd Street branch uh, across the street. Um, today was made possible by the Modern Women's Fund and the Wikimedia Foundation. We want to thank our fiscal sponsor, Qubit, for putting up with us. Um, we would like to thank our friends and allies, Afro Crowd, Black Lunch Table, Pow Arts, and Wikimedia NYC. Uh, we would like to thank uh, our amazing volunteers and their queen, Sarah Klugage, uh, for showing up every year early in the morning uh, and helping make this happen. Um, and we want to thank you all for being a part of the project. Um, and we'd also like to thank very much uh, our wonderful panelists uh, and moderator. And uh, I'm going to let you get started. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, bring this down. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Danielle Jackson. I'm a curatorial assistant in the Department of Media and Performance here um, at the museum. Um, I returned to the museum this past um, September. Um, I did 18 months at the Walker Art Center working with the Visual Arts and Performing Arts Department. Um, but I'm just gonna share a quick little story about how I came to the museum in the first place. Um, I first came to uh, MoMA in 2015 to work on a project, um, the first comprehensive monograph of um, of the choreographer and visual artist Ralph Lemon. Um, I ended up working, writing my, my thesis on him. Um, and so, so um, my external thesis advisor, who at the time was Valerie Casal Oliver, was asked um, by Thomas Lax here at MoMA who could come to work on this Ralph Lemon project. And Valerie said, Danielle Jackson, she's wrote this 60 page paper you know, on Ralph Lemon and on his work. Um, and what that work was, was um, an engagement with Ralph Lemon's piece, Come Home, Charlie Patton, which is a 90-minute theatrical um, performance um, by Ralph Lemon that kind of looks at the American South as like the ground zero of African-American culture. Um, it follows this main character named Elias, who um, basically visits places where bad things have happened. He goes there. He goes... Um, to lynching locations, to places where civil rights demonstrators were, um, and he enacts movements. Um, simple gestures like driving up to Mega Evers home and bowing, um, walking across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, um, throwing Amazing Grace, albums like Amazing Grace, Someday We'll All Be Free, getting to the end of it, turning around and bowing and calling in an art prayer. Um, so the movements um, were based off of key terms, courage, praise, fury, deluve, counter memorial, push yourself against a wall. Um, and there's one key word that I often come back to, which is called shaky elegance. Um, and it's a term that uh, Ralph Lemon actually uses when um, discussing civil rights demonstrators, particularly um, demonstrators who were forcefully hosed down on the streets of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and he uses it to talk about, you know, the kind of violence in that in that gesture, um, on the act of these, uh, on the act of, um, you know, police officers attacking these demonstrators, but the kind of beauty in the demonstrators' movements 
um, as they were actively resisting. Um, and so when I was asked to moderate this panel, I kept coming back to this term. Because um, for me, in a broader sense, it, um, it points to the way in which certain bodies have to move and they have to navigate um, certain social um, landscapes, particularly bodies of color, trans bodies, and queer bodies at large. Um, and it's something that I see all of our panelists' work dealing with on some level. Um, and so I just wanted to introduce that so that we can kind of mold on that, marinate on that. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name's Alokis, and tell me a joke, Alok. And I'm going to begin with some poetry. What feminine part of yourself did you have to destroy in order to survive in this world? Answer, I'm trying to figure it out. What would it look like to leave the house and not be afraid of being bashed? What would it look like to leave the house and not be bashed? What would it mean to leave the house and not be harassed? What would it mean to leave the house and not be objectified? What would it mean to leave the house and not be gendered? What would it mean to no longer be forced to do the work of gender? What would it mean to own my own body? What would it mean to have a self beyond my body? What would it mean to log online and not be told to die? What would it mean to, not, to, to go outside and not be told to die? What would it mean to have people say, I'm here instead of you're fabulous? What would it mean to no longer have to be fabulous to survive? What would it mean to be able to go home wearing what I want? What would it mean to be desired wearing what I want? What would it mean to be desired from me and not my body? What would it mean to be desired for me and not my body? What would it mean to be desired for me and not my body? Is it that I don't remember anymore, or is it that I never knew? Is it that I don't remember anymore, or is it that I never knew? They will say that femininity is not powerful. They will say that we are vain, selfish, and foolish. They will say that we need to focus on the real issues. They will say nothing when we are attacked. They will say that we do not exist until they need someone to blame. They will say that that they will say that we need to focus on the real issues. They will say nothing when we are attacked. They will call us imposters, frauds, predators, mistakes. Mostly they will say that we are ugly. They will say that we should shave, try harder, disappear. Sometimes they will not say, so they will spit, point, grope, laugh instead. They will say that we should die. They will say that death is not enough, so they'll make us suffer. They will say that suffering is not enough, so they'll say that we made it up. They will say the wrong names and pronouns when we are gone. They will say it is our fault. They'll erase us from history, family, legacy. They will try to erase us from their fantasies. They will fail. They will bash us in public. They'll want to be us in private. I said, you will bash us in public. You'll want to be us in private. They will say that femininity is not powerful. But I have stopped traffic simply by going outside. I have suspended time. I have made everyone watch. I have shed every category, word, and lie. I have etched myself so deep inside they will never forget me. I have found a way to live forever. They will say that femininity is not powerful. So I'll put on my dress. So I'll go outside. So I'll prove them wrong. Today a man on the street pointed to me and said, what the hell is that? I wanted to turn around and tell him that I got this dress on sale and I got this body for free. But you, you've been making me pay for both ever since. To the man who said, you better get the fuck away from me or else today on West 15th Street. I wonder if your request for space was to make explicit the distance between who you pretend to be and who you actually are. I worry about the toll this disconnect is having on you. It is hard to live in a world where our most intimate desires are the ones we are told to repress. I spent the rest of the day filling in the sentence for you, or else I will kiss you, or else I will cry on your shoulder, or else I'll have to stop lying to myself. I'm sorry that you've been made to fear something as simple as want. I too am afraid of the things I want to the point of need. The truth is, I needed you to finish the sentence. I needed to know. I need you to understand. You were a stranger on the street, but in that moment, you were every person in my life who wanted to love me but ended up hurting me instead. Thank you. Uh, 
Good morning. My name is Simone Brown, and I'm a professor um, of uh, Black Studies at University of Texas at Austin. And I research um, surveillance, and particularly um, what happens when when blackness enters the flame. What happens when we put center the conditions of black people when it comes to questioning the politics, the practices, and the performances of surveillance. And that could look anything from how biometrics are used at borders, at um, places where the border gets um, activated, police-worn body cameras, electronic monitoring post and pre-incarceration, and what happens to the devices when we throw them away um, and they end up in a landfill of electronic waste in spaces like Akargana. And in particular, I was interested in, I still am interested in um, airports, another site in which borders get made and remade, where people are called into question, um, and, it's, and in particular, the, the passenger pre-clearance zone. So this is the space of security theater, where we have certain scripts, certain performances, and instructions to take off our shoes, our belts, um, our bodies are checked and scanned. And even the overhead address um, would say, if you see something, say something, forcing us to understand everything around us as, alarm, as alarming or potentially so. The airport, a school, a subway, uh, any other type of public space. Uh, I was particularly, I, I'm interested in the type of labor that gets done in those spaces, particularly by, I keep on saying particularly, I'm probably nervous, but that's done by um, working class people. And we see that come to the front recently um, with the government shutdown. And so if we, if we think of the passenger pre-clearance zone, if we are in the so-called war on terror, that this is a site of a, a military theater of operations. And it's often black women who are at the front lines of that site, um, checking my hair that's like circumscribed as like already dangerous, or um, giving me a pat down using the back of their hand um, or so. And so this image right here is actually from uh, a TSA uh, security director, Susan Hallowell, and she was uh, demonstrating um, how at the time a um, backscatter machine um, used to detect uh, objects such as a gun on her or a bomb. Uh, this is what, what we often see um, at the airport after we go through the, um, the uh, scanner, the um, uh, imaging technology. And so at the airport, it's the TSA agent that does these um, visual, visualizing gender, making those determinations by pressing uh, a blue scan for male and a, a, a pink scan for, um, for, for female. And so, and then in that 2015, uh, the TSA, so the idea of like, not only like our bags, but also our bodies being alarming, the TSA changed their language from uh, anomaly um, to uh, alarming. And so for me, this, this site of, um, of, of the border, of security theater, is not outside of our understandings, and I'm using a collective hour here, of citizenship, of the body, of gender, of race, of terror, and other kind of markers of, of identity, social, like social location, and practices. And so I hope we continue to have this conversation about security and surveillance today. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Che Gossett. Um, I am a, uh, a writer um, and a kind of like um, reluctant academic, I guess. Um, and um, I'm honored to be here. Um, it's my first time at this uh, edit-a-thon, so I wanted to say thank you to the organizers so much for bringing us all together. Thank you for like my companions in um, feminist and trans thought and black thought. Um, and yeah, I'm really just happy to be in this space. Um, I wanted to uh, read a bit from a, a, what, what I'm working on um, now that is uh, basically I'm m kind of uh, composing into a chapbook. Um, and the tentative title of it is called um, Cruising in the End Times. And uh, I tweet a lot. It's like my most sustained mode of writing right now. Um, so what I've done is kind of archived and collected my tweets into into like a manuscript. Um, and they're really like disjointed because you only get 140 characters. And um, 
So I'll read a bit, and some of it relates to, uh, I guess, the reasons of why we're all here. <clears throat> the feeling when you're too cute for gender and human and animal binaries. The feeling when an older white cis couple is trying to figure out what your shirt means. Too cute to be binary. Towards trans inscrutability. Femme as failed masculinity and faggotry. Femme shouldn't reinforce the gender binary. It should corrupt it. Trans as gender in ruins. Let's all be ruined together. What happens when we're ruined together? Black trans as gender's fugitive. Trans as being on the run from gender. This Halloween, I'm going to be the ghost of my butch masculinity. If white people like minimalism so much, why don't they just disappear? <laughs> Channeling Jose Munoz, I'd actually argue that blackness is the thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough. Chroma politics. Black love and black thought are both never enough in and always too much for this world. Make space for black rage. The feeling when you want to get a 3D printer to make a copy of yourself for work purposes. <laughs> what if we all cried at the gym? Black trans feminism as always already what Hortense Spillers calls insurgent ground. The real existential question for cruising in the end times. Could you ever be with someone who doesn't love memes? I've decided to call my wayward, crooked, unruly, deviant teeth queer and love them for it. The last part is about reading. <clears throat> reading. Reading done generously and receptively and promiscuously. Reading as submission. Reading as non-monogamy and resisting the notion that we must be married to any particular thought style, theory, philosophy. Reading as polyamory. Haven't we all had so many lovers and don't we continue to yearn for more? Reading as insatiable desire, as taking in more than one. Reading as being more than one. Reading as scission. Reading as torsion, reading as suture, reading as lust, reading as tactile, as fingering the pages with pleasure and anticipation, reading as erotical politics, reading as showing the fiction of the subject-object distinction and their relation of interplay, reading as entanglement, as ontology, as being with, as becoming, as worlding, as individual, as beyond the threshold, as touching feeling, reading as play and exchange, reading as willing, as vulnerability, as opening and stretching, reading as anality, reading as whole because there's no whole, reading as non-sovereign, reading as virality, as contagion, as transmission, as transference, as being both analyst and analyst and, as projection as, and intro introjection, reading as being a bossy bottom, pleasure of the text indeed. Thank you. Hello, everyone. That was amazing, your poem. Um, so I wanted to start um, with a very basic question. Um, and I think what led me to this, Alok, you actually wrote um, a piece on your site. And you talked about um, posting a photo of yourself in a swimsuit. Um, but then you go on to say how that was repurposed, um, put into memes, and you talk about how people effectively use you to become. Um, and the way you reclaim that, I thought it was so powerful. 
Um, and it made me think about the through lines um, in you guys' work. Um, writing and like performance and spoken word um, becomes prominent. Um, and particularly when I was reading um, your piece, Alok, I was, I was thinking about what a powerful weapon. Like why is it that you know, it's writing and performance? Like what is productive about that space in particular for each of you? <laughs> um, for me, I guess, you know, we all have our lanes. <laughs> and my lane is not performance or poetry or visual art. And, and, and perhaps it's quite uh, for selfish reasons. It's because I just love the archive of, and broadly speaking, of how I get to an answer to a question that I have or a possible mm -hmm. answer. And, and for me, writing allows me to do that and then also pull from poetry and mm -hmm. visual arts and the kind of uh, intellectual work that those, that those sites do mm -hmm. to, to answer a question about the memification of black pain, mm -hmm. um, uh, the use of, uh, you know, of, of reaction gifts of, of uh, black children in pain. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that's where um, the, the practice of writing has been important. Yeah, um, that's a wonderful question. I also just wanted to thank you for your opening about Ralph Lemon and shaky elegance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm still sitting with. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think for me, like, writing um, ha is so such an integral part of the traditions, um, with a small t, um, mm -hmm. that uh, influenced me and that are kind of close to my, my um, heart, I guess. Yeah. Um, and uh, in particular, I'm kind of thinking of, um, you know, writing in the black radical tradition mm -hmm. um, and uh, how writing has always been um, a source of resistance against forms of capture. Mm -hmm. um, so that goes from like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, mm -hmm. um, a whole kind of like intellectual legacy of um, weaponizing writing under conditions of, um, almost nearly unlivability and sometimes actual unlivability mm -hmm. um, to like George Jackson and um, other writers who wrote uh, under forms of constraint and how like even while those people may have passed on, part of the tradition is like that we're still inheriting their weaponized mm -hmm. thoughts. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I see it as kind of like part of a, a political project and political, mm -hmm. political struggle. So, um, yeah, and poetry, I guess, even though I have such a, like, you know, um, untrained relationship to poetry or something, yeah. like queer relationship too, yeah. um, like just in terms of how it lets you disrupt some of the protocols um, of writing um, the ways that, yeah, uh, allows you to play mm -hmm. and perform, really, yeah. um, on the text and as the text, mm -hmm. um, and uh, outside of it too. Um, so it can be really embodied. Um, yeah, so. I think performance for me is one of the only places we can be honest anymore. Um, and I think one of the paradoxes that I hold dear to my heart is that simulation is where we approximate meaning, mm -hmm. that it's through pretending to be that we become. And what I've sort of learned in my life is like the reason we flock to like movie theaters and watch like, maybe this is just me, but. Uh, oh, watch like the latest like capitalist like boring romantic love plot is something about the simulation of love makes it real and I think for me uh, what I started to realize is like most of the time it feels like I'm drowning because we're pretending that this is not performance and what I like about performance is we're being explicit that it that's what it is you know yeah. whereas everywhere else it's like you go to your nine to five job, you like have your mon monogamous partner, you're like, this is natural. And it's like, none of this is natural, you know? <laughs> like we weren't meant to work. Um, and, <laughs> like, and so I feel like performance, we suspend that kind of uh, lying. And we actually are saying this encounter is performative and that's okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that way it kind of denaturalizes everything. And one of my favorite things about being a performance artist is just sort of flipping the script my latest show is called Watching You Watch Me, mm -hmm. and actually holding a mirror to the world and saying, am I performing or are you? Mm. That's beautiful. Um, so I started uh, my intro with this idea of shaky elegance. And I know you guys haven't had um, 
much time to deal with that. Um, but I'm curious about how you might see that, how it resonates like in your own work, in your own practice. Um, because for me, like when I wrote um, on Ralph Lemon's piece, um, that was one of the most intense things I had ever done in my life, um, to so rigorously focus on one piece. Um, there were um, a number of histories that I had to engage with to get through it. I, the second chapter of that, I like read exclusively about lynching because I just kind of needed to go there. But what I but I was obsessed with this idea of shaky elegance. Um, and what I came out with is that, like, in a broader sense, like, what it, um, like, for me, that term is really about movement and navigation um, and how you, you know, how you navigate, like, some of these barriers that are placed in front of you, um, you know, with how do you move? How do you move through it? Um, it's, a, it's a power thing. I think it, that framework really resonates with me and it invites me so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot about how in the city it was a criminal activity to do what I do every day, mm -hmm. which is wear more than two articles of clothing different than mm -hmm. the sex I was assigned at my birth. And I think about how when people were thrown into prison, by and large, th instead of stopping, they increase their fabulosity. Mm -hmm. And I think about that as my art practice, is there's a direct correlation between the kind of violence I experience mm -hmm. and the emotional alchemy I do to make it fabulosity. Mm -hmm. That the more slurs that I get, the higher my heels are. <laughs> or mm -hmm. the more trolls that I have, yeah. the more prints I clash, yeah. but aren't clashing because mm -hmm. that's a Western framework. Um, so I think for me, what shaky elegance is, is getting spat on and then still going outside. It's getting pushed on the train and then still upping my antic. Yeah. And I think that's, for me, something distinctive about trans femininity is that at every level and every single movement around gender, uh, we get sort of cut out as the excess, as mm -hmm. too much and yet always never enough, uh, too visible but not woman enough, too um, desirable but not lovable enough. Mm -hmm. And I think about how, for me, um, what shaky elegance, or now, in this moment, yeah. universe creating, <laughs> is about is actually trying to say, do I want stable elegance? No, that's boring, yeah. one. And two, it requires me to constantly ask myself, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. the, the, the luxury of having to fall down is having to ask, do I want to get up? Or is there something about the ground that I enjoy? And I think what shakiness has brought in my life or precarity or instability mm -hmm. is actually a fundamental recognition is, is this instability or is this just what it is? I think I'm really into New Year's resolutions. Anyone else? Um, <laughs> I'm just looking for validation throughout this entire morning. And one of, the uh, one of the sort of resolutions I made this year was that chaos is not good or bad, it just is. And I'm really trying to submit to the disorder of everything and not put a moral framework to it. Yeah, um, I think uh, to, you know, um, both, Danielle, what you were saying about shaky elegance and Alok, what you were saying about, um, you know, uh, trans feminism and um, makes me think of, oh, the anti-cross-dressing laws, you know, um, that were kind of institutionalized um, across the U.S. and still persist in prisons right now. Yeah. Um, Prison is a anti-fabulous institution, and, <laughs> and like uh, is designed to like eliminate trans life. Mm -hmm. um, so a necropolitical institution yeah. and a biopolitical institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think of uh, like a lot of my work has to do with archives mm -hmm. and thinking about the shaky elegance of Black trans archives, um, both like um, in a material sense, like you know. Um, in a, in a time of trans, so-called trans visibility, how can we like really make visible our own paths? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just in terms of the, the kind of historicity of, of that shaky elegance, it makes me think of like Mary Jones, um, who was a black trans woman in the 1830s who um, faced a lot of surveillance. She mm -hmm. was a 
sex worker um, and was criminalized and then her image was sensationalized, mm -hmm. like put on posters. Um, so the kind of like virality pre mm -hmm. the internet and pre social media was yeah. the was print. Um, and uh, she was, uh, had to give a statement in court. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure she was full of shaky elegance. And she was asked like, oh, why do you dress this way? Mm -hmm. And in the court transcript, it says like, um, I've always dressed this way around people of my own color. Mm -hmm. And it really made me think about um, that always. Yeah. And how our, um, our past are, are, are like um, uh, full of their own shaky elegance that we have to preserve mm -hmm. and continue. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's like, I guess I see like archives and, and, um, and, and their afterlives as, as part of like um, this like political project basically. Yeah. I, mean, I did, didn't know the term before, and when yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. about it, I was thinking of uh, Corin Gaines, uh -huh. um, and who was um, killed in a police standoff in Baltimore in 2016, in the uh -huh. summer of 2016, and and then the, the afterlife of that. So um, this was some th I, I was able to see parts of this standoff because it was streamed on, she was streaming it on Instagram. Mm. And I know in your work when you were discussing um, shaky elegance, um, you applied that term to some of the work of Charles Moore's uh, photography yeah. around the civil rights movement. Yeah. And this is the type of photography that's taking place for many now. Mm -hmm. um, but with the idea that it can be collectively watched on almost a global scale yeah. uh, through that, through art, through like the indexing it through the hashtag, yeah. say her name and Corin Gaines. And so, I don't know if, if fabulous is the word for me in, in that case, mm -hmm. but there is something about um, remembering mm -hmm. her as an ancestor mm -hmm. and that kind of fabulous resistance and rebellion mm -hmm. in that moment. Yeah. Which brings me um, just thinking about um, the way, um, like you talked about, you saw it via like a live stream. Um, I guess it begs the question, is like that kind of, is surveillance like always in the negative? Um. <laughs> Broadly defined, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like are there like, I mean, ways to challenge it or um, like strategies for um, navigating it? I mean, I mean, in an anti-black world um, yeah. and, and surveillance being a fact of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. It's this like it's necessary to create strategies yeah. um, of um, you know as Dean Spade calls mutual self aid mm -hmm. of um, a kind of collective of uh, of abolition mm -hmm. um, to to challenge and to confront um, the surveillance state mm -hmm. and I yeah and I and I like the challenge that you're doing on a space like Twitter yeah. with your writing writing in public in that way yeah. um, turning that space in its head this kind of very commercial space mm -hmm. of of surveillance of like data mining but using it to do something else. I think that is the, the work of, uh, of turning those things on their head. Mm -hmm. Any more thoughts? Um, why, um, why Twitter? Uh, is it just because of, um, I mean, you said it's the, the space where you write the most. Um, is that just because um, the convenience of it? Like, what is that about for you? Yeah, um, I think I guess it's I I was on Facebook for a long time. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but I think like I don't know. I guess like I often write out of a feeling mm -hmm. and like an impassioned, um, maybe rage or like mm -hmm. different type of affects. Yeah. Political emotions, mm -hmm. and um, I found, and and you know the real timeness of it. Yeah. So I don't know. I think it just becomes a space where I feel like pressurized and then I like say something mm -hmm. um, and it's consistent um, that feels different than, uh, feels different than, um, you know, Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I'm still thinking about your question about like, is surveillance always a kind of negative? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um. My other thought. Um, 
Yeah, I, don't, I think like in a broad sense, like negative, yes. Um, but I've been trying to challenge myself about, um, I mean, just thinking, going back to shaky elegance and thinking about um, that being about a kind of navigation, that being about a kind of existing in the world. Um, it's like, you know, how do we, despite everything that is sort of brought onto our bodies and that is put in front of us, um, you know, how can we create a new future for ourselves or a better way of, of living? I don't know if that's a question, but it's more of a, a kind of thing I'm grappling with. Um, I think I don't have that answer. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's a big deal. Just so to validate that yeah, I'm yeah, asking yeah. life questions like that, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I think a lot about is, uh, as a performer, I'm participating in an economy that is such a charged space for me, mm -hmm. because I feel like, both in terms of race and in gender, the stage has been the only place people like me could ever be regarded. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not incorporated or allowed on television screens yet. Mm -hmm. um, or our bodies are not palatable enough to be on billboards, so the stage is where we greet you in mm -hmm. the kind of freak show legacy. And uh, there's a way in which I, at first, was very resentful of that position mm -hmm. because I always have to foreground my body in order for my ideas to be perceived. Mm -hmm. I don't have the luxury of being able to be abstract mm -hmm. because I'm constantly rendered literal. Um, and at first I really questioned, like, did I consent to being a performance artist or was this where I was put to be gawked at? Mm -hmm. And what is different about this than a human zoo? Mm -hmm. Because people will come and sort of experience the collective fantasy of transgression and then no one will think that I have a life beyond my performativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I started to actually think I'm consenting to this and I'm choosing to be here. And I began to question what it means to occupy positions of hypervisibility mm -hmm. and to try to do something different. Um, and I, th I don't know if that's possible, or, but I, I actually am kind of over kind of cynical thinking mm -hmm. that like feels very 2016 to me. Yeah. Like <laughs> cynicism, masculinity, like buying, like mm -hmm. I'm bored. And so what I'm really trying to do is actually like find kernels of possibility in extremely bleak situations mm -hmm. without romanticizing, which is yeah. like difficult. Yeah. But what I've really learned is that actually there is a way to occupy these kinds of institutions of hypervisibility and to do them to a different purpose. And we've become so eloquent in articulating the ways in which hypervisibility is non-consensual, mm -hmm. but we've lost the ways in which people are using visibility to do something different with it. And I, I think that my sort of cohort of performance artists and especially trans performance artists are doing something really exciting um, and actually playing around and fucking with and toying with visibility. And I think that deserves to be recognized. Yeah, yeah just to, I, I think I've been just um, like sitting with, y you know, thinking about surveillance and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, how that's so wrapped up with, like it's a technology of anti-black power basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Simone, your work is like all about tracing how surveillance like goes back to the plantation, um, you know, and thinking about France Fanon and um, other ways that black studies has been a study of like the visual mm -hmm. and how racism has been wrapped up in the visual. Um, and thinking about like, you know, um, thinking about how like, um, you know, transphobia is like so wrapped up with like ideas of um, what it means to have a body and how what it means to have a body is wrapped up with whiteness mm -hmm. and colonialism. Yeah. And like, um, so for me, I think like part of uh, black feminist like literature and scholarship that's like really important has been to kind of like diagnose that, mm -hmm. um, like things from like, you know, during like as an example, like during segregation, you know, um, bathrooms, right, that yeah. we're still navigating mm -hmm. were segregated. So it would say like man, woman, and then have one other one for colored yeah. as a way to situate blackness outside of gender normativity. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one, um, which is its own form of surveillance, like the gender yeah. binary and, the, and how that's wrapped up in anti-blackness. Mm -hmm but also um, it makes me think about what was happening in, in intramural colored so-called space yeah. and um, about how sometimes even as we have to navigate surveillance all the time, um, sometimes like 
we look at each other and how we look at each other yeah. and how we create looks for each other mm -hmm. and that kind of like, and cruising even. Yeah. And I, I know that it's an imperfect thing, um, but I'm, I, I think I'm really interested in like, you know, how do people create um, like temporary fabulous zones, right? That can like mm -hmm. dissipate or what are these kind of like interstitial moments where we, we look at each other in a way that sabotages or subverts or goes under the radar mm -hmm. of surveillance as a form of like um, community, basically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to get back to what Alok said about, um, about we, we, we aren't meant to work and also being on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I just, uh, and we're tired, yeah. you know? I do a Wikipedia um, edit-a-thon with my students um, maybe one ev once every two years when I teach um, a class on um, digital media. And we would often come back the next day and the work is gone or it's been in dispute some way. Mm -hmm. And so those types of like claimings of spaces mm -hmm. on, on places like Twitter, but, but I'm talking about um, Wikipedia now, yeah. it's exhausting to do this work. Yeah. And who needs to pull up the weight, yeah. um, move the ground or shift the ground? Because you know we weren't meant to work. And I'm thinking of uh, the, the creative work of um, uh, these two artists, uh, Niva Costa, and I'm, I'm missing the name, but it's the Black Power Naps. Yeah, and the yeah. creating a space as a performance. Mm -hmm. Do you mm -hmm. know the other artist's name? Uh, Fanny Sosa. Oh, Fanny Sosa. Sosa, Sosa, yes. Sosa. Um, and just to create, create a space for, for, for black rest, mm -hmm. to take a power nap, yeah. and, and, and to recognize the exhaustion of being in, in, in spaces for um, racialized people, mm -hmm. for trans people, for queer people. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah. So as, as we go to, 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 to move into this edit-a-thon, to think about like the labor that it takes to keep these spaces going for the yeah. claims that we're making around situating whoever the artist it is that, or whoever is the person mm -hmm. or the page um, that we're working on. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, because it, the system is there to make us tired, tired. and to yeah. wear us down and to keep us on the ground but not questioning why the ground itself, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's time to go to questions. Uh, when you said it disappeared with the work uh, on the Wikipedia, what do you mean? Oh, I don't want to be um, discouraging. <laughs> 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 but, but, you know, there, there are people that monitor. There, um, I forgot the names. Um, but there, there are people that do monitor changes in pages if pages come up um, and, then we'll, and then put them into sites of question. And so it's, it's to be vigilant about um, you know, whether my students are committed to returning to that page, answering the questions on some of the discussion boards, but, but yes. Um, yeah. That it's a, that it's, a it's a community based, yeah. yeah. or someone else can explain since I'm not a Wikipedia base. But it's, it's like a collectively based encyclopedia, so things have to be vetted. Um, and often, like for example, um, if you are naming a, or creating a page for a particular person that might not have a, uh, I'm losing my words, but someone might, be, might say that this person is not popular enough, they're not cited enough to be in this Wikipedia page. We, we want some more proof that this person or this act deserves a page. And so we have to think about like the politics of citation even on a space like Wikipedia and what gets valued and what gets devalued and be vigilant because those types of things about calling for a certain type of citation um, is a way of like um, disallowing certain, per certain people, certain ideas and certain facts on a Wikipedia, on a community a collective page. And also the idea of like we need to continue to join that community and do that work um, and, and you know, basically outnumber <laughs> the people that are on that, trying to keep it one particular way. It's okay. I'm pretty loud. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, just sort of thinking about this idea of shaky um, elegance, I feel like one part of that is kind of being vulnerable in the shakiness, and I feel like as people of color, as queer people, it can be very, like, you know, scared to show vulnerability because it can become sort of like a point of attack. So I just wanted to ask sort of about how you allow yourselves to be vulnerable and have the space to do that while at the same time, you know, s 
there's always this pressure to be strong, and I'm just you know wondering about navigating sort of that dichotomy. It's a good question. Um, I don't know, I think there's strength and vulnerability, and I think we show that whether we want to or not in different ways. Um, I think I have to think about it more, but. I do agree that there is vulnerability in that, but I mean, if you think about um, just civil rights demonstrators, I mean, that was like, there's vulnerability in that, in that they're like exposing their bodies, right? Like they knew that they were gonna be forcefully hosed. They knew that um, dogs would be, you know, would bite them um, and so on, but they chose to do it regardless. Um, and they chose to move in a matter that actively resisted. Um, so I think like a part of it for me is like, some of these things already exist. I don't know if it's a matter of like how to do it or if there's like one way to do it. I think it just is, if that makes sense. Like it's just a strength that you inherently, um, that is kind of inherently brought forth, I think. I like, um, I just want to validate the, the pain behind that question first, yeah. which is like a question of like, what does it mean to, to love when you're heartbroken? Mm -hmm. And what does mm -hmm. it mean to trust when you're constantly violated? And that's my art practice, mm -hmm. um, is because I feel like to live as a queer trans artist of color is to live perpetually unreciprocated, mm -hmm. is to give, is to give, is to give, is to give, and to never receive and is to love, is to love, is to forgive, and to be demonized in that process. And so I think at every single level, I'm tempted to close, and I'm tempted to stop, um, but then I remember that's precisely what they want. And so for me, vulnerability actually is a form of kind of resistance in a world that requires, it's a type of ableism uh, to pretend that we're strong and competent and individuated when none of us are. Yeah. And I think that that's the dilemma is when you're oppressed, you have to respond by being like, no, we're strong, we're competent, but actually no one's strong and no one's competent. And uh, vulnerability then becomes a kind of honesty to say, hey, I'm a mess, you're a mess, we're all a mess, you know? Yeah. Um, I staged a cry-in for Valentine's Day. <laughs> it was a huge career highlight for me. <laughs> And I invited 40 strangers, or potential friends, as I like to call them, to come together and wear all black on Valentine's Day at a gallery. And I had just one microphone, and I invited people to cry um, and to, to speak about something that they were currently going through. And I was sort of saying, as I was saying, performance allows a space of honesty. Something about a spotlight or a microphone allows people to share. And the first hour and a half was so awkward, because I was just like, okay, anyone want to go up? And I was like, you know? But then like once one person started to go, then it just came. And then there's always that sort of recollection I get after a performance where it's like, I don't know these people, but I love, like, I love these people. Like those, these are my people, you know? And then it allows you to think maybe everyone is my people. And maybe actually when they actually were honest, we could build that kind of intimacy. So I think that what I do is I create zones that encourage vulnerability. Rather than telling people, be vulnerable, I think that's white feminism. <laughs> Um, I think the actual <laughs> intervention is like, let me create a space where you can safely be held in this vulnerability. Let me create an infrastructure, a set of accountability, and a set of community standards where certain kinds of vulnerabilities are elevated because not all vulnerability is, is, is mm -hmm. synonymous. And I think this moment of feminism really requires that interrogation. Who's allowed to feel publicly and who's not? Just, I, I didn't know what to expect this morning, and I just wanted to say I love all four of you, oh, and you've made you. me cry the whole morning. So I want to just say that you guys have a kind of realness that's fascinating and really um, inspiring and moving. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more questions? Hi, I have a, a bit of a question in formation, but um, a look, especially uh, given your fabulousness, let's just call it what it is. Um, I'm curious about your uh, relationship to the fashion industry and uh, if you could just comment as you wish on that topic. 
Wow, like this is gonna turn into a whole nother sermon. <laughs> what is the fashion industry but the, ec the extraction of this? <laughs> I think it goes to what you were beginning with that sort of photo that I posted. And basically I posted a bikini photo for New Year's, you know? I was just ready. Um, and I got a lot of trolls, like, like th thousands of people telling me to die, that kind of thing. And one of the ways that I get trolled is, is men and women will tag their friends in photos of me and be like, ha, 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 it's you. And I was thinking about that sense of what does it mean to be disappeared but to still be needed, to be central to the construction of the body politic, but then to be subsequently not recognized, you know? And I started to realize what is gender nonconformity but the place with which cis people and increasingly binary trans people point to and say, I'm not that. And what is the fashion world but pointing at people who are actually practicing fashion every day and saying, I'm not that. That, that were fundamental and intrinsic to it, but then subsequently disarticulated from it. And so I feel very frustrated with the fashion world because I feel like trans, feminine, racialized people built it. <laughs> And it's just obvious to me that the material history of beauty and fashion is us. We designed the dresses, we taught you how to walk, we taught you the makeup styles. What is contemporary beauty culture but drag makeup? Like, we created it. We taught you how to wear wigs, we taught you, like, oh, we, we made heels relevant. Like, we did so much of it, and then yet it's just put on the sort of Victoria's Secret, white, thin, cis woman. And it's, it's very frustrating because people will say, oh, don't engage with it, you know? But I actually think inherent in that dismissal is a refusal to understand the political economy of aesthetics and how aesthetics and that kind of extraction enables genocides, that actually there's a relationship between visual culture and material distributions of power. So I think we actually do need an analysis of fashion. It's a multi-trillion dollar industry and there's so much money for that. Like when I go, when I'm invited to speak rarely, but at like fashion places, I say like murders of trans people is a fashion issue. You should be able to wear whatever you want without fearing violence. And then they're like, what? <laughs> but I'm trying to sort of reframe that to actually be like, for me, style has always been, I mean, I didn't consent to my gender or my race, so I, I dressed myself up, you know? It became the space with which I could disarticulate people's assumptions of what I should be. And style has always been grounded in my politics and it's really weird to see people just get dressed to like be fashionable. I'm like, that's not what I'm doing. But I know Che, you have a lot of feelings about fashion too, right? Uh, <laughs> I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you kind of, um, I just wanna like echo what you just said. Yeah, I think like, especially a part of, about, about extraction and being the kind of ground zero for um, yeah, and, and the ways in which aesthetics is always already like a political issue, yeah. I do wanna respond though to the vulnerability question um, and be super, I guess like vulnerably honest and, and um, say that something that I've been doing for the past couple years is, is like doing uh, martial arts practice mm -hmm. and uh, the one that I've been doing is, is called Muay Thai and it's Thai kickboxing. And I kind of fell into it because um, uh, community members um, uh, that I know um, and love and care for um, uh, were doing, well really there's like a tradition of basically like queer and trans like um, also of color like self-defense. And I think that um, for me martial arts is a way in which like my, I'm reminded of my bodily vulnerability, but also, and also at the same time, of my own strength and power. And that those two things aren't mutually exclusive, but actually they're inseparable. Um, and so that's something that, um, and also I find martial arts to be like a, a praxis space and like a critical theory space. So like the body, like th thinking about how, how do we move? What are the ways in which we move? How do we use our bodies? Um, and, and find our power um, and uh, that kind of like the potentiality of that and the radical potentiality of that and also like how it's been a part of political struggle. Um, so yeah, that's like how vulnerability is, is like speaking to me right now. I think we have room for one more question. Oh, 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.